1 Samuel chapter 15 Introduction In this chapter we have the final rejection of Saul from being the king for his disobedience to God's command in not utterly destroying the Amalekites By his wars and victories he hoped to magnify and perpetuate his own name and honor but because of his disobedience he ruined himself and laid his honor in the dust This chapter splits as follows. 1. Saul was commissioned to destroy the Amalekites. Saul wins, but he executes God's commission only partially. Verses 1 to 9. 2. Saul gives reasons for his mistakes. Verses 10 to 21. 3. Samuel prophesies God's judgment against King Saul. Verses 22 to 31. 4. Agag put to death was 32 to 33 5 Samuel's final farewell to Saul was 34 35 Saul was commissioned to destroy the Amalekites Saul is victorious but God's commission was only executed partially verses 1 to 9 The Amalekites were a people who had occupied the frontiers of Egypt and Palestine their territory extended over the whole of the eastern portion of the desert of Sinai to Rephidim Exodus 17:13 to 15 they had acted with great cruelty towards the Israelites on their coming out of Egypt Exodus 17:8 they further aggravated their crime when they came upon the Israelites who were faint and weary and smote all who were lagging behind who were too weak to keep up with the rest Deuteronomy 25:18 So God purposed that Amalek as a nation should be blotted out from under heaven Exodus 17:14 Then the Lord said to Moses write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because i will completely blot out the name of amalek from under heaven though this happened more than 400 years before god still held it against the amalekites god could have judged amalek directly as he did against the cities of sodom and gomorrah but since amalek's sin against israel was a military attack god wanted to make the judgment fit the sin the day of their judgment finally came god clearly told samuel to tell saul to bring a total judgment against the amalekites the people were mustered at telaim a city of the tribe of juda towards the coast of edom joshua 15:21 there were 200000 foot soldiers and 10000 men from juda saul was certainly a capable military leader he was capable of mustering and organizing a large army he also knew how to time his attack properly because he set up an ambush in the ravine saul said to the kenites verse 6 go away leave the amalekites so that i do not destroy you along with them for you showed kindness to all the israelites when they came up out of egypt so the kenites moved away from the amalekites the kenites were an ancient people jethro the father-in-law of moses was a kenite hobab his son was a guide to the hebrews through the wilderness They had a portion of the promised land near to the city Arad. Judges 1:16. They dwelt in tents which made it easy for them to move to other lands as they wished. Many of them at this time dwelt among the Amalekites. Here, though they dwelt in tents, they were fortified by nature for they put their nest in the rock. Numbers 24:21 Balaam had foretold that they should be destroyed Numbers 24:22 Sparing the Kenites 
was a selective and incomplete obedience on Saul's part. It is dangerous to be found in the company of God's enemies and it is our duty and interest to come out from them lest we share in their sins and plagues. Revelation 18.4 Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, that is, from Egypt unto the Red Sea. This was the area where the Amalekites lived. First, Saul took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and all his people he totally destroyed with his sword. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. To spare the best of Amalek, that is, the king himself, is surely equivalent to sparing some root of evil. This shows his utter unfitness to perform the duties of a delegated king in Israel. Saul gives reasons for his mistakes. Verses 10 to 21. The Lord was grieved that he made Saul king because he had turned away from him and had not carried out his instructions. God's heart was broken over Saul's disobedience. The man who once had a humble opinion of himself, 1 Samuel 9.21 and who once hid among the baggage out of shyness, 1 Samuel 10.22 eventually went his own way in disobedience. The Lord said, I am grieved. This is the use of anthropomorphism where God explains himself to man in human terms so man can have some understanding of God's heart. Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel had God's heart. It hurt God to reject Saul and it hurt God's prophet Samuel to see Saul rejected. Saul came to Carmel in the south of Judah. There Saul set up a monument in his own honor and went on down to Gilgal. The erection of this vain glorious trophy was an additional act of disobedience. His pride had overborne his sense of duty in raising this monument to his own honor and then going to Gilgal to offer sacrifice to God. Saul's conduct was characterized by pride, rebellion and obstinate disobedience. When Saul persisted in declaring that he obeyed, alleging that the animals whose bleating was heard had been reserved for liberal sacrifice of thanksgiving to God, his shuffling answer called forth a stern rebuke from the prophet. He justifies his conduct by saying that his people did not take the cattle and sheep in order to enrich themselves by it, but to sacrifice unto the Lord. This is the first of a series of his excuses where he blamed the people, not himself. Second, he included himself in the obedience by saying, the rest we have utterly destroyed. Third, he justified what he kept by saying, because of its fine quality, I took the best of the sheep and the oxen. Fourth, he claimed to do it for a spiritual reason, that is, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. It shows that Saul was desperately trying to excuse his sin by word games and half-truths. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. This was a very proper answer to Saul and refutation of Saul's excuse. Pride and disobedience make us blind to our sin. 
what was completely obvious to Samuel was invisible to Saul. We all have blind spots of sin in our lives and we need to sincerely pray the prayer of Psalm 139, 23, 24 by asking God to search our heart to see if there are any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. The rest we have utterly destroyed. As it turned out, not even this was true. There were still Amalekites left alive. David later had to deal with the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 27, 8, 31, 2 Samuel 8, 12. Haman, the evil man who tried to wipe out all the Jewish people in the days of Esther, was a descendant of Agag. Esther 3, 1. Most iconic of all, when Saul was killed on the field of battle, an Amalekite thrust the sword onto Saul and killed him. 2 Samuel 1, 8-10 When we don't obey God completely, the leftover portion will surely come back and trouble us, if not kill us. Samuel prophesies God's judgment against King Saul. In his empty religious practice, rebellion and stubbornness against God, Saul rejected God's word. So God rightly rejected him as king over Israel. Saul's rejection was final, but it was not immediate. God used almost 25 years to train up the right replacement for Saul. Saul refused to accept his sin and instead blamed the people. I have sinned because I feared the people. This was the best excuse he could make for himself. Had he feared God, he needed to have feared people. The prophet then pronounced the irreversible sentence of the rejection of Saul and his family from the royal line. He was judicially cut off for his disobedience. When Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. In an agony of mental excitement, he took hold of the prophet's dress to detain himself. The tearing of the robe was a mystical representation of his severance from the throne. Just as the robe tore because Saul grasped it too tightly, so his tight grip on pride and stubbornness meant the kingdom would be taken away from him. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. This is to remind Saul that the Lord is determined in his purpose and is strong in his will. There will be no change. Verse 25 Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. He was conscience smitten for the moment, but his confession proceeded not from sincere repentance, but from a sense of danger and desire of averting the sentence denounced against him. For the sake of his own honor, before the elders of his people and before Israel, he besought Samuel to join with him in a public act of worship. Under the influence of his painfully agitated feelings, Samuel went back with Saul to worship the Lord. Agag put to death was 3233. Agag came unto Saul confidently since he had gained the favor and protection of the king. He was confident that the worst is over and that he would be spared. Samuel calls Agag to account for his own sins. Agag followed the example of his ancestor's cruelty of shedding righteous blood. God's judgment against him and the Amalekites was just. Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Though Samuel offered many animal sacrifices, this is the first time he killed a person. 
Notably, Samuel did it before the Lord in tough obedience to the Lord God. Samuel's final farewell to Saul was 34-35. This section tells about the tragic split between Samuel and Saul. Samuel left for Ramah and Saul went up to his home in Gibeah. Ramah and Gibeah were less than 10 miles apart, but they never saw each other again. And Samuel came no more to see Saul. But we read in 1 Samuel 19, 22-24 that Saul went to see Sam at Nioth. But this does not affect what is said here. From this time, Samuel had no connection with Saul. He never more acknowledged him as king. He mourned and prayed for him and continued to perform his prophetic functions at Ramah and at Nioth. 1 Samuel chapter 15 Questions First Samuel chapter 15 Answers 